In previous discussions, we have studied several techniques to solve classification and regression problems using linear models. However, real life applications often present tasks that a linear model may not be able to solve properly. Given here are two toy examples, one for binary classification and one for regression, where no matter how carefully we learn a linear model, it will never be able to give satisfactory performance. To solve such problems, we need to look at an entirely new class of models known as nonlinear models. My beautiful friends, this is CS771, Introduction to Machine Learning, and let's get started. Before we learn about nonlinear models, it would be good to first renew our friendship with linear models. A function is called linear if it is additive and homogeneous. Specifically, the function value on the sum of two inputs must be equal to the sum of the function values on those two inputs individually. Also, the function value on a scaled input must be the same as taking the function value on the unscaled input and scaling it by the same amount. It turns out that real valued functions that are linear can only be of a very specific type. Namely, they are always the dot product of the input with some fixed vector. Proving this is fairly simple. We consider the standard basis vectors where the ith standard basis vector has a 1 at the ith coordinate and zeros everywhere else. We look at the values that our function is taking on the standard basis vectors and then arrange these values in a vector. We then exploit the fact that every vector can be written as a weighted combination of the standard basis vectors. This allows us to get an answer simply by applying the additivity and homogeneity properties of the linear function. Please solve these exercises to increase your familiarity with linear functions and their properties. Show that a linear function must give zero output if the input is the zero vector. Find out which sort of polynomials are linear functions. Show that every linear function is convex too. Explore if the converse is true as well and if every convex function must be linear as well and come up with counterexamples if your answer is no. Finally, recall that the family of LP norms that we have been using in several applications are also real valued functions over vector spaces. Are these norms linear functions? Affine functions are a close cousin of linear functions. If you wish to sound fancy, you should tell your friends that affine functions are merely translates of linear functions. However, in more direct terms, every affine function is simply a linear function plus a bias term. In fact, all the functions that we have encountered so far in our ML conversations have all been affine functions. It is natural to get a bit confused with this terminology. The biggest difference between linear and affine functions is that the former do not have bias terms, whereas the latter can have bias terms. Consequently, if we build a binary classifier out of a linear function, its decision boundary must pass through the origin. As you would have guessed by now, ML folks are fairly careless about using the terms linear and affine interchangeably. In fact, when someone uses the term linear model in the context of machine learning, most often they are talking about an affine function instead. Similarly, today we will learn about nonlinear models that will be non affine as well. Another somewhat confusing bit of nomenclature is the concept of a map. A linear map is a linear function whose outputs could be a vector instead of a scalar. It must satisfy additivity and homogeneity just as before. Similarly, affine maps are just affine functions with possibly vector outputs. In fact, the terms function and map are also used quite interchangeably. Just as real valued linear functions had a very specific form, as we just saw, Linear maps must also be of a very specific form, namely that their output must be the product of a matrix and their input. This proof is left as an easy exercise, 
along the same lines as before by inspecting the function outputs on the standard basis vectors. As a corollary, we get the result that affine maps must also be of the form AX plus B where X is the input to the map, A is a matrix and the bias B is now a vector. Pay close attention to the dimensionality of these maps. If an affine map G has d-dimensional inputs and e-dimensional outputs, then it must be of the form AX plus B, where A is an E cross D matrix and B is an E-dimensional vector. If we mistakenly take B to be a D-dimensional vector or take A to be a D cross E matrix, then we will get an error. This caution must be exercised even when coding up machine learning models in a language like Python. Time for some more fun exercises. Are constant functions always affine? Are they always linear? Linear and affine functions are figuratively joined at the hip in more ways than one. Show this cute result relating linear and affine functions. It turns out that affine functions have a curious property of preserving convexity. If the inputs to an affine function are all the elements of a convex set, then the outputs also form a convex set irrespective of whether the outputs are scalars or vectors or if the dimensionality is the same or not. If you are up for a challenge, you can try to show the converse as well. Every convexity preserving map must be affine. We are now ready to discuss how nonlinear models are learned. There are two broad strategies that are most popular when machine learning folks want to learn nonlinear models. However, Given that we know how to learn linear models so well, it is unsurprising that both these strategies proceed by reducing the problem of learning nonlinear models to that of learning linear models. The strategies differ in how to perform this reduction. The first strategy learns nonlinear models by using a combination of multiple linear models, whereas the second strategy modifies the features of the data point to make them suitable to give good results with the linear model itself. Examples of the first strategy include decision trees and its variants and nearest neighbors and its variants. Examples of the second strategy include neural networks and kernel methods. In today's discussion, we will take the example of decision trees and neural networks to see how these strategies work to learn nonlinear models. Modern machine learning systems can often combine both strategies to build very powerful models for commercial and web scale applications. Let's start with decision trees and take a simplified version of the binary classification problem that we had seen earlier that cannot be solved by a single linear model. However, notice that if we restrict our attention to a small region of the space, say the right half of the space, then a linear classifier can indeed perfectly classify points in that region. Similarly, there is a classifier that perfectly classifies points in the left half of the space, although this classifier is different from the one that worked for the right half of the space. This gives us a neat way to solve the problem using a hierarchy of classifiers. First, we ask whether a point belongs to the left half or right half of the space. Depending on the answer that we get, we apply the appropriate classifier and get the output. This strategy will perfectly classify this problem. Such a hierarchy is called a decision tree in machine learning literature. This name makes sense since we are taking a decision whether to apply one classifier or the other classifier and also because these decisions are organized in the form of an inverted tree with a root node at the top which has two children, two child nodes, a left child node and a right child node. Both these child nodes themselves have two children each that are leaf nodes. These are called leaf nodes because they have no children of themselves. At this point, it is natural to be curious as to whether there could exist other ways to have solved this problem using this splitting technique. For example, one could have instead divided the regions into top and bottom instead of left and right. And in general, there can exist multiple ways, 
several decision trees, all of which solve the same problem. A more general decision tree would look something like this, with a root node that has children nodes. Here we have the special case of a binary decision tree, where every node has either two children or is a leaf with no children. Notice that the nodes are arranged in levels, with the root node at the top level, its children in the next level, its grandchildren at the next level and so on. At each node that has children, also called internal nodes, a decision is made by invoking a binary classifier, whether to go to the left child of that node or to the right child of that node. Once we reach a leaf node, no more decisions need to be made and we are ready to give our final output. It is easy to see that if we take specific parameter values for the classifiers at the internal nodes and assign appropriate outputs to each leaf node, then we will solve this problem perfectly. Notice the interesting decision boundary produced by this decision tree classifier. Details of how decision trees are learnt will have to wait for another day. Decision trees are usually learnt layer by layer with the number of layers having to be decided by the machine learning model designer as a hyperparameter. Also note that decision tree learning is known to be an intractable NP-hard problem which means that it is unlikely that a polynomial time algorithm exists that will learn the best, most accurate and most efficient decision tree to solve a given problem. Decision trees can also be used to solve regression problems, although in that case they are often called regression trees. Let us take the example of the regression problem that we saw at the beginning of today's discussion that cannot be solved using a single linear model. Even in this case, we see that if we divide the space into a bunch of regions, then for each region, a single linear model does satisfactorily solve the problem for points in that region. This allows us to build a regression tree of the following kind with a root and two children nodes, both of which are leaves. The root takes a decision whether to ask the left child or the right child and the chosen node invokes a linear regression model to give an answer. If we set appropriate parameter values for the binary classifier model at the root and the linear regression models at the leaves, then we perfectly solve the problem. Notice that regression trees beautifully combine linear classification models to partition the space into regions and then apply different linear regression models to each region to solve a non-linear regression problem. Let us move to neural networks now and see how they can solve the classification problem we just solved using decision trees. As we have noted, neural networks operate by taking the original features for a data point, modifying them to create new features and then applying a linear model on top of those newly created features. For this problem, let us choose this simple transformation that takes the original features, applies a linear map to them using a matrix A and then passes each coordinate of the resulting vector through a ReLU activation function. The resulting vector is this new vector to which a linear classifier is then applied. Thus, the output of this neural network would look something like this. It is common to depict the actions of a neural network in the form of a network diagram such as this. The circles in these diagrams are nodes, each representing a coordinate. The nodes in the lowest layer, also called the input layer, are the input nodes and they usually contain the original feature coordinates of the data point. The network transforms these features into new features using linear maps and then passes them to nodes in the second layer that apply non-linear activation functions such as the ReLU. These result in creation of new features. Those new features are then subjected to a linear model and a sign activation is finally applied to get a binary output. Note that the output of this network depends on the values of A, W and B which are the parameters of this model. Model parameters such as these are typically learnt using training data and algorithms such as stochastic gradient descent and its variants. For now, let us fix A, W and B to these values shown here and see what happens. 
we first take the original features and then apply the linear map to them. As a result of this linear map, some of the points change their positions and others stay put. We then apply the ReLU activation function that converts all negative coordinates to zero. This gives us this new set of features that this neural network has obtained. Finally, the classifier is learnt on top of these new features. Well, as you can see, the neural network did not quite solve the problem. The culprit could be that the model parameter values for A, W and B that we chose were not good. But another possibility is that the very kind of features that this neural network was looking for were simply not the right ones. For example, maybe ReLU was not the best choice of activation function and maybe we would have succeeded had we chosen the sigmoid activation instead. Fortunately, in this case, the architecture of the neural network is not at fault and the kind of feature transformations that the phi function is learning in this case are good enough to solve the problem. It is just that the model parameter values A, W and B were not the right ones. Let us try again, shall we? This time, we choose a different set of parameter values for A, W and B and see what happens. We again start with the original features, transform them using the linear map due to which the features change their positions and then apply the ReLU activation which sets all negative coordinate values to zero. However, we see that this time something very interesting is happening. The points of the two classes are quite well separated from each other under these new features and we can actually use a linear classifier to completely separate the two classes. Given the critical nature of the parameter values, it is imperative to learn them carefully. Additionally, the architecture of the network plays a huge role by deciding what sort of feature transformations are being learned and how many dimensions do the transform features have. For instance, in this example, we had given the network the capability to learn two new features. Each of these features looks like the ReLU function applied to a linear combination of the original features. We got lucky this time, but for some other task, we might need to give the neural network the ability to learn some other kind of features or maybe more than two features. At this point, you may be wondering what is the decision boundary of this neural network classifier. The decision boundary surely looks like a line with respect to the new features since the final classifier is a linear one. But what does the decision boundary look like with respect to the original features? To answer that question, we need to unroll this network. Let us take the features back to where they came from and write down the long and ugly expression that captures the exact function used by this neural network to perform its classification. Fortunately, there are some tricks that we can use to simplify this expression, which tells us that this neural network is actually learning a fairly simple classifier. The classifier checks whether the absolute difference between the x and the y coordinate of a data point is greater than one or not. Armed with this knowledge, we can now plot the decision boundary of this classifier and note that this classifier divides the entire feature space into three sections, the middle strip labeled purple and the rest being labeled yellow. Notice how different this classifier boundary looks from the one that the decision tree had learned for this very same problem. Time for another fun exercise. Notice that a classifier that checks whether the absolute value of the sum of the x and y coordinate of a point is greater than 1 or not will also perfectly solve this problem, although it will draw the strip in a different way and have a different decision boundary. Find out values of the model parameters a, w and b for which the neural network will yield this particular classifier. Let us now build a neural network to solve the nonlinear regression problem that we had seen earlier. This time, we need not worry about applying the sine function to the linear model at the top because we are performing regression and not binary classification. Notice also that the original feature in this case is one dimensional. 
For this task, we choose a slightly different network architecture. This architecture takes the original features, a scalar in this case, and applies to it an affine map instead of a linear one. This affine map has two parameters to it, a scaling vector A and a bias vector C. Applying the ReLU activation then completes the feature transformation on top of which a linear model is then applied. The network diagram of this neural network is also very different from before. Notice that bias terms are often depicted in these diagrams by introducing dummy nodes that always store the value 1 inside them. This is similar to the trick that we have seen before where the bias term is hidden inside the model vector for linear models by appending a 1 with the feature vector. Notice that the final output node in this network does not have a sign activation since we are not solving a binary classification problem and instead we are solving a regression problem. Finally, note that although the original features were one dimensional, the network transforms them into 2D features before applying the linear model. Such changes in dimensionality of the features during transformations is common with neural networks. However, since the neural network is increasing the dimensionality of the data, in order to show you the action of this network as an animation, we will need to go to a 3D visualization. Here it is. Notice that the x-axis goes from minus 3 to 3, the y-axis goes from 0 to 5, and the z-axis goes from 0 to 4 in this figure. Let us use these values for the model parameters. We will use the x and z axes to show the transformed features and the y axis will be used to show the regression value. However, we will cheat a bit to save space and use the x axis to denote the original features as well. Given these values of the model parameters a and c, the transformed features look something like this. The first transform feature looks like ReLU applied to x minus 1, where x is the original feature, whereas the second transform feature looks like ReLU applied to 1 minus x. These will be represented in the x and z axes respectively. Let us now bring in the data points. Let us get rid of their y components since those encode the label and the neural network will only manipulate the features. Recall that the first new feature is ReLU applied to x-1. To obtain this, we shift everything by one unit and then truncate all negative coordinates to zero. Notice that the first three points had x feature values less than one, so their new x value gets truncated to zero due to ReLU. The other three points had x feature values greater than one and so their new x value is their original x value minus 1. Let us now calculate the z feature value for these points. Please note that the z values for the data points will be computed using the original feature values and not the transformed ones that we have obtained just now. The z feature value is ReLU applied to 1 minus x. This means that the last three points whose original x feature had value greater than 1 will get their z axis value truncated to 0 due to ReLU, as we can see here. On the other hand, the first three points that had the x feature values less than 1 will take z feature values greater than 0. This gives us the final 2D features of the data points. Let us now bring back the label values by giving these points their appropriate y-coordinate values and raise these points to their appropriate height depending on their y-value. We find that this new regression problem can now indeed be solved using a 2D linear model with model vector w as the all ones vector and the bias value 0.5. This completes our task. The previous examples have shown how neural networks can effectively learn nonlinear models. The key to this is the ability of a neural network to learn new features that are nonlinear functions of the original features. 
the most common type of such feature is obtained by performing a linear or affine transformation to the original feature and then coordinate wise applying an activation function such as ReLU, Sigmoid or their variants. Neural networks get a lot of power by stacking such features. The features obtained by transformation of the kind described above may be transformed again in a similar manner but using a different affine transformation. Those features may themselves be further subjected to repeated transformations and after several such transformations, the final feature values can then be subjected to a linear model. The parameters in all these multiple transformations are typically learned using some SGD variant and training data. We saw how the neural networks in the previous examples were able to cleverly twist the features to make them neatly fit a linear model using just a single feature transformation. Neural networks that apply several layers of such transformations are able to twist the features in all sorts of ways, giving them a lot of power to learn complicated decision boundaries with ease. However, it is notable that for a neural network to learn a nonlinear function, its activation functions must be nonlinear as well. If that is not the case, then a neural network cannot learn nonlinear functions. Let us show this formally. Consider this neural network that uses an affine activation function. Show that this neural network can only learn linear models. Next, explore what sort of functions can a neural network learn that uses the quadratic activation function. To get more exercise on feature transformations that can help make linear models do well on nonlinear problems, Attempt these simple geometric exercises. In the first exercise, we wish to implement this diagonal classification pattern but under the restriction that the classifier must have no bias term and the model vector must be the all ones vector. In the second exercise, we wish to use a binary classifier to distinguish the interior of a circle from its exterior. Keep in mind that although the model vector in this case can depend on the exact position and size of the circle, the transform features must not. The third exercise requires something similar but using a hyperbola instead of a circle. In today's discussion, we saw that whereas linear models are easy to understand and learn, real life applications often require non-linear models. Machine learning uses clever tricks to get the best of both worlds by reducing the non-linear problems to linear ones. Decision trees do this by learning several linear models, whereas neural networks do this by jointly learning good feature transformations on top of which linear models do indeed do well. However, non-linear learning problems are challenging and learning the optimal decision tree or the optimal neural network for a given problem is usually an NP-hard problem. Nevertheless, several heuristics exist that do allow us to learn reasonably good decision trees or reasonably good neural networks in reasonable time as well. So this is a good place to stop. Stay classy as ever and see you next time.